Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gutter, the prison of the grave. There's no other end, but they never learn. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in... The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Fifth Mask. Brother, am I glad to see you. You are Philip Marlowe. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm Marlowe. Well, come on in. You're uh, not exactly what I expected, Phil. No? Mm-mm. I didn't realize private detectives came in the deluxe edition. You'd like a drink, wouldn't you? Now, look, when you called me a few minutes ago, it was strictly panic because your life was in danger, Miss Barr. Vivian now you... will do, Phil. Yeah, well, okay, Vivian. What's happened in the meantime? Happened? Nothing. Why? Well, you seem pretty well balanced for somebody on the edge of being a homicide statistic. Well, I'm doing my best to hang on to myself, that's all. Oh. But now that you're here, I can breathe again. You just sit down, won't you, over there. I'll fix the drink. Uh-huh. We're going to get along fine, Phil, I can care. Yeah, well, could be. There. Now we can be more comfortable. Your health, Phil. Your health is supposed to be the point, baby. You said a man threatened your life. Yes, a man named Fred Sears. A character I used to know. He was hurt in a hotel fire six months ago. Oh. <laughs> Must have been his head. He thinks he wants to kill me, and he's come to town to do it. But now that you're here... I, uh, I suppose he's got reasons, huh? Do they matter? Yeah, yeah. To me, at least. I like to know which end of the stick is short before I grab. Well, I'm not even sure myself. I only knew Sears briefly. Here, here's his picture, Marlowe. Mm -hmm. Oh, the whole affair was stupid. So you brought it to me instead of the police, huh? I brought it to you because I need private help and I'm willing to pay for it. Pay very well, I might add. Uh. Oh, look, Phil, you don't have to bother about the reasons why. Just see that Fred Sears leaves me alone tonight. It shouldn't be hard. Is your drink all right? Delicious. Too bad I can't stay and finish it. What? Oh, Marla, wait. You mean you won't help me? Not on guesswork, baby. But don't you realize my life's in danger? I'm scared. Oh, sure, sure. Speechless. <laughs> you can get yourself another boy, Vivian. Woods are full of guys with no curiosity at all. Oh, Marlo, please be reasonable. Good night, baby. I had no doubt that a guy named Fred Sears wanted to kill Vivian Barr. And that she was genuinely afraid of him. But I also had no doubt that working for her without all the facts was like playing blind man's buff with the front end of a jet plane. Sooner or later, you were a cinch to get sucked in. So I drove off the hill toward the Sunset Strip again and prepared to forget it and go home. Until my rearview mirror told me that I'd picked up a tail. I wagged it back and forth across Hollywood for 20 minutes without losing it. Then I stopped at a quiet corner bar in my neighborhood, went in the front door and straight on through to the alley and then around to the front again. I got back in time to see the man who'd been following me get out of his car and head for the door. It was one Mutt Pomeroy a sleazy ex-comrade in arms who had his private license revoked for assorted malpractices a year ago. I waited till he was almost up to the entrance before I stepped out where he could see me. I... Oh, well, Phil Marlowe. <laughs> what do you say, kid? How, uh, how's business? I keep smiling. Sure, sure you would. Uh, buy a drink, I don't suppose. What's on your crummy little mind? Take Let's it. have it. Easy, Marlowe. Take the hands off. Oh, What's the right. idea? You've been telling me just to keep in practice. What do you want? Okay, okay, hot shot. I figured maybe you'd appreciate a little cooperation. For instance, you tell me why Vivian Barr wants a private peeper, and I'll tell you something more than worth your while. Well? I thought your license was dead, Pomeroy. Yeah, it is, but I'm not. I still got eyes and ears and a mouth that I like to keep well fed. Now, look, I can help you plenty in this case, Marlowe. What do you say, kid? Get together? I didn't take the case. You what? That's right. If I catch you tailing me once more, Mud, I'll tie a can to you. Now beat it. Yeah, well, let me know when you need a hand, Marlowe. Right across your kisser. Ah, be 
Are you ever so humble? Oh, no. Hello, Marlowe speaking. Oh, Phil, I've been calling ever since you left. This is Vivian Barr. Now, look, baby, I oh, told Marlo, you a few minutes... listen min- to me. I've got to have your help. I'll tell you the truth, all of it. Anything you want to know, only come back, please. Oh, will you listen? I'm trying uh, to tell I've you. I've seen someone outside here, Marlowe. I'm almost sure it's Fred Sears. Hurry, will you? I'll tell you everything. Hurry! Three things I can never resist. Beer with a head on it, moonlight, and a beautiful dame. So I headed again to the parking terrace at Vivian's apartment house and made it in about 15 minutes. I was out of my car and halfway across the terrace before I noticed the changes. First, her apartment was dark. Second, a man who had just pulled a key from a front door lock froze when he saw me and then turned and bolted through a clump of hibiscus and cornered himself in an enclosed patio. He tried to make it over the wall, but the second time he fell back, I nailed him! No, no, please, let me go. I gotta get away from here. You're trying it the hard way, Buster, believe me. Oh, it'll be easier by way of Vivian's apartment first. Come on, on your feet. Now, who are you? I'm Douglas Peck. Douglas what? Just Douglas. Okay, just Douglas. We'll also straighten that one out inside. Go on, open the door. No, I... It's locked. Sure, sure it's locked. Take the keys out of your pocket and unlock it. Hurry up. Who are you? Name's Marlowe. Go on inside. No, no, please, Marlowe. Listen, I... I can't go in there again. What's the matter? Afraid of the dark? Go on! Turn on the light! All right, then, all right? There. Vivian Barr's eyes were still open. But all the life had gone out of them. She'd slid half off the blue velvet divan onto the floor, and a gleaming gold satin she wore was stained red by a dark, stiffening smear on her chest. Her purse was open on the coffee table, and spilled out of it was a note. Addressed, Dear Vivian, and signed Fred Sears. What is it, Marlo? What are you looking at? One good reason why Vivian Barr ended up like that. Here, read it. Dear Vivian, the broken back you handed me six months ago wasn't as hard to take as the broken promises. Count on seeing me real soon. Fred Sears. Yeah. Now, Douglas, the digress, assuming you didn't kill her, and it was this Sears, what was your connection? Oh, I was just a friend of hers. Business associate. well heel business associate, judging by your wardrobe. She mentioned your type, but not your name. Let's get on with that, shall we? Marlo, listen, I, I had no idea that Vivian was mixed up in it. Marlo, look. Huh? There at the window at Sears. Kill the light. Keep down, Douglas. I'll be right back. <laughs> Sears ducked as I ran for the door, and when I got outside, he was rounding the corner and heading for the enclosed patio. He was up on the wall by the time I got close enough to grab for him. No, you don't. Why? Oh! Oh! His foot caught me in the side of the head. I wound up on my back with nothing but the torn-off pocket from his jacket in my hand and a crumpled pack of cigarettes and a slip of paper on the ground with a phone number. I picked it up and started back to Vivian's apartment in time to hear a car door slam and see just Douglas, scared, stiff, crouched behind the steering wheel of a step-down Hudson. A second later, car and all were gone in a funnel of dust. Well, I couldn't lose much more, so I went back into the house to use the phone. Los Angeles Morning Star. Society editor, please. One moment. Okay. Society desk, Miss Ludlow speaking. Hiya, Corey. Phil Marlowe. Phil, darling, how are you? <laughs> Gee, it's been a long time, mister. I haven't seen you since... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, look, honey, I need some fast help. Crashing somebody's party, Marlowe. Could be, but it's strictly business. Now, can you give me a rundown on a phone number? Crestview 54124. 54124? Yeah. Just a minute, lover. Okay, sweetie. Oh, yeah, Phil. That's the old J.G. McKay mansion, 910 Mission Drive. Uh His niece, Celia McKay, has the place now. She married up with a guy named Paxton last fall, I think. She has oodles of money. Any help? I'll let you know. Thanks a lot, baby. Before I left, I called Lieutenant Matthews at Homicide and told him what happened. He said he'd put out a call for Fred Sears and suggested I keep in touch. After that, I drove to Beverly Hills. The McKay Mansion at 910 Mission Drive dominated the rows of bowing trees that lined the long, curving driveway like a dowager queen presiding at court. When I rang the bell beside a carved mahogany front door big enough for an airplane hangar, it was the butler who finally opened it for me. (laughs) It was all he could manage. Yes, sir. My name's Marlowe. I'm a private detective. I'd like to see the head of the house, please. Uh, Have you an appointment, sir? No, this is a courtesy call so far. 
There's been a murder, Buster. Now, please get Mr. Paxton, Celia McKay, Paxton, or any reasonable facsimile thereof, huh? Never mind, Cartwright. You can run along. I'll take care of this, whatever it is. She was, uh, friendly. Red-headed and hefty, but wore a dress so well-draped it would have made a Notre Dame tackle look good. It was all held together at the neckline by a big, dazzling brooch made up of items on a Mardi Gras motif, and each covered with enough jewels to retire a family of five. Except for a space in the center shaped like a mask, which was dull, black, and empty. I must have been staring, because that's where she picked up the conversation. If you've finished making your estimate now, Mr. Marlowe, maybe we can get down to business. I'm that reasonable facsimile you mentioned, Mona Paxton, Celia's sister-in-law. Oh, and Mr. Paxton's your brother, huh? Same thing. Yeah, well... You said something about a murder, I believe? Mm, that's right. A woman named Vivian Barr. And is that supposed to mean something to the members of this household? Maybe we'd better ask them. I don't think so, Mr. Marlowe. We're all quite busy here. Now, look, now, Mona, I and... followed a lead that started at the body of a dead woman, ended here at this house. You people can talk to me now or the police in a few minutes. Make up your mind police? fast. Police? What about the police? Mona, what is this? Excuse me, my dear. I'm sorry. I'd hoped you wouldn't be bothered by the... by Mr. Marlowe here. In his opinion, we're all murderers or something. I see. And why do you say that, Mr. Marlowe? I don't. It isn't quite that bad. And specifically, how bad is it, if you don't mind? I don't mind at all. I'm looking for a man named Fred Sears in connection with the killing of my client, Vivian Barr. I'm here because there's a definite tie with somebody in this house. Now, at this point, I'm still asking for cooperation. This has gone far enough. It's preposterous. Mr. Marlowe, until you mentioned their names, I never heard of either of those people. Mona? No. They're still my husband, Mr. Marlowe. Dear, will you come out to the door, please? What's going on? What's the matter? There's a person here I want you to meet. Mr. Marlowe, my husband, Mr. Paxton. Why, how, how do you do, Mr. Marlowe? I'm doing better, Mr. Paxton. Oh. Douglas, Mr. Marlowe here wants to know if the names Vivian Barr or Fred Sears mean anything to you. Why, I, I don't think so. No. No, they don't. Why? You may leave now, Mr. Marlowe. We've given you all the cooperation we can. If you come back, you'd better have a warrant with you. Okay, Celia, I will. Because one of you three is a liar. And I can prove it. So if you want to talk it over before I call in the cops, I'll listen for a while. Hey, Cartwright. Yes, sir? You called, sir? Yeah, you look like a fairly honest man. Where can I get a good cup of public coffee around here? Oh, why, there's, there's a little shop two blocks down, sir. Thanks. And to you, Cartwright... Good night. In just a moment, we'll return to the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first, Sunday, September 10th. Note it well or you'll miss a whole lot of laughs. For that's the day Jack Benny checks in again at CBS The Star's address. Yes, this Sunday is the day Jack, Mary, Dennis, Phil, Don, and Rochester return for another great season of top-ranking comedy. Be sure you're on hand this Sunday and every Sunday when CBS brings you the one and only Jack Benny Show. Now with our star, Gerald Moore, the second act of Philip Marlowe, and tonight's story, The Fifth Mask. The two-ton front door of the Paxton home closed behind me. I dropped the cocky attitude quicker than a chorus girl lets her stage smile go when she hits the wings. I knew that I was still a long way from finding Fred Sears. And ten minutes later, when I was in a corner booth at the plush Beverly Hills version of a one-armed joint Cartwright had suggested, I began to worry about it. Until the front door swung open and admitted Mrs. Celia McKay Paxton. She threw a stern eye in a sharp semicircle that nearly sliced the place in two and then bore down on me. Mr. Marlowe, I want to talk to you. What do you mean by... Why don't by... you sit down, Mrs. Paxton? Well, I... Very well. Now, Mr. Marlowe... Coffee, Mrs. Paxton? No, no, thank you. Mm. Mr. Marlowe, specifically, what did you mean when you said that one of the three of us was lying? Specifically that, Mrs. Paxton. I don't think I could have been more blunt, but I'll try. I'm after Fred Sears and anybody or anything that can lead me to him. Now, you. Why are you here, Mrs. Paxton? Well... It's, uh, Mr. Marlowe, it, it, it's, uh... Hard to say, maybe? Well, I... Hard like I'm suspicious of my husband's connection with all this, Mr. Private Detective. Will you go to work for me? Is that it? Oh, no. No, not that. Mm. 
But, Mr. Marlowe, I'm no fool. I know that I'm a plain-looking rich woman who loves her husband. And I... Well, sometimes men are silly. And if there is anything, I... Mrs. Paxton, I can't go to work for you. I don't take that kind of a job. Besides, I'm already working on your problem in so far as it concerns the late Vivian Barr. I don't understand that. If you say you're looking for a Fred Sears. But not overlooking anything else, Mrs. Paxton. Like the outside chance that Sears didn't kill Vivian Barr. I didn't see it happen, you know. It could have been somebody else. Who? You. What? Uh... After all, you just implied a good motive. No. No, I, I didn't. I, I only gave you a suspicion. A dark, ugly thought I'm ashamed I ever had. That's all. And I didn't kill that woman, Mr. Marlowe. I know you didn't. It was only bait, Mrs. Paxton. I hope you'd snap at it and come back with an answer that would get me to Sears. Mr. Marlowe, I never heard of these people before tonight. I know, that's what you said. But you see, Mrs. Paxton, even as you, I too sometimes have dark, ugly thoughts that I'm ashamed of. Only in my case, it's business. And tonight, the business is Vivian Barr's murder. Good night, Mrs. Paxton. <laughs> Comfortable, Mr. Paxton? Marlowe, please. My wife may see us. Get in and drive away. Hurry. All right. Just for size, hurry it is. Now, Marlowe, tell me. Does Celia know? About Vivian? Hard to say, Paxton. Look, I've got to tell you the truth. Don't bother, man, about town. It sticks out like a sore thumb on a hitchhiker. You like it easy, you like it smooth. Your wife was one, Vivian the other. It's not a new story, Paxton. But believe me, Marlowe, I couldn't help myself. And I've learned my lesson. Marlowe, with money, say... Fifty dollars now, and more later. Would that help you forget what you know? Fifty bucks? Well? <laughs> you didn't love Vivian Barr. You hated her, didn't you? I hated... How did you know that? A cheap bribe you just made. Indiscreet gentlemen with their backs against the wall don't offer peanuts now and more later unless they're broke. You could be broke, Paxton. If, for example, Vivian was blackmailing you out of every cent of your allowance, good enough? She was rotten. Rotten enough to kill? Kill? Are you crazy? My lord was Sears. Maybe. I didn't see him do it. You had a good reason. He had a better one. Sears was taken in just like I was. When he met Vivian, he had a few thousand dollars, and she fell in love with every one of them. You said a better reason, Paxton. And I'm getting to it. I came into Vivian's life after Sears was hurt saving her in that hotel fire. Saving her? Yes. I didn't know that. I thought he was hurt, period. Yes, that's all the papers got. But he was injured because he rushed into the fire to save Vivian. She couldn't afford to have it known that she was at that particular hotel at that particular time. She told me so herself. You didn't quit even then, huh? I couldn't, Marlowe. I wasn't strong enough. And then later, when I was, she wouldn't let me. Not without paying. And that's the whole story, Marlowe. Mm -hmm. Unless you're still holding back a lead on Sears. Why should I? Because if you're it, Paxton, not Sears, you've nothing left but the slim hope that Sears, who knows he's framed, will be shot running away from the police. No, you're wrong, Marlowe. That's not it. All right, then try this. If I'm wrong and Sears is still the one we want, he could also be after you, Paxton. You know, you're a pivot man in that triangle, too. What? Why, I never thought of that. What am I going to do? Grab a cab and go home and hide in the cookie jar. Marlo, don't be facetious. My life... Relatively safe, Paxton. I was only trying to trick you into spilling something on Sears. Oh. Then you no longer think that I killed Vivian? I didn't say that. So long, Paxton. My apartment was only a few minutes from Beverly Hills, so I decided to call the police and fill them in. Also, a little all-alone straight drinking might burn the bad taste out of my mouth. But when I was in the hall there, I knew it was going to be a little while before I got a chance to do either one. After all, there was still a Paxton to go. Mona, the lady with the beautiful Mardi Gras brooch, and the not-so-beautiful mind for business. I've been waiting for you, Mr. Marlowe. That figures. Come on in. I'll get the lights. You don't seem surprised you expected me? Yeah, as much as the others. Already huddled with your brother and your sister-in-law. Have a seat. No, thanks. Mr. Marlowe, I'm going to come right to the point. That's a switch. Want a drink? No. Do you want $1,000? Mr. Marlowe, I said... I heard you. Yeah. Also, Miss Paxton, I've heard a lot tonight about all I can take. I'll make it fast, will you? All right. The 1000 is yours, Mr. Marlowe, if you'll do one thing. When you catch up with this Sears, if you haven't already done so... I haven't. Keep my brother's name out of this, that's all. Well, it's a little too much. Also, you're a little easy, Mona. Your brother isn't worth covering up for. That's not news, and it's beside the point. The thousand is to help me, not him. 
I've spent five very difficult years getting the rights to a cosmetic formula that can't be beat. The point, Mona, the point. All right, the point, Mr. Marlowe, is that all I need now is backing. Just yesterday, I got the promise of it. $150,000 worth of promise from my sister-in-law. This is Celia McKay Paxton. And I'll lose that promise, Marlowe. Celia gives my brother his walking papers. And she will if she finds him out. Will you take the money, Marlowe? No. No, will I go out of my way to whisper in Celia's ear? You're practically safe, Mona. Practic? Who else is there? Sears. The police take him alive. There's a good chance to make a lot of embarrassing statements about your brother killing his girl and... You expect someone. Oh. Unless the police are tired of waiting to hear from me. I shouldn't be seen here. Not if you're going to keep Doug's name out of Easy, this. honey. Get in there. The kitchen. Oh, yes. Thanks, Marlo. Thanks a lot. Okay, coming. Keep your shirt on. I... Oh, no. Yeah, well, did you expect to see little old Mutt Pomeroy so soon again, eh, kid? Mind if I come in? Very much. What do you want, Pomeroy? To show my wares, Phil boy. You know, like the jewel tea man. Skip the funnies. What is it? Fred Sears. I know where he is. You sure about that? Sure, like I don't take $3 bills. I followed him tonight when he got away from you. All right, come in. Hey. Nice place, Phil. What's your price, Mutt? 200 I'll pay one, the address. The money. Okay. Here. 15 16 80, 90, 90, 100. Yeah. Thanks, Phil, boy, thanks. The address is 31 Bayfront Drive, Santa Monica. It's an all-alone beach joint, kind of neat. Belongs to a friend of Sears who's out of town. Oh, he's using his car, too. I overheard him explaining to a neighbor. Yeah. Good night, Marlowe. See you around, huh, kid? Mm-hmm. Oh, uh, Pomeroy. Yeah? Yeah. What is it, Phil? Two questions. Uh-huh. First... Your connection with all this, what is it? Oh, a hunch that I could pick up a little extra. You see, I spotted Pax and I with that Vivian babe once, and well, I knew who he was. Also, I knew who his wife was, so I figured... Yeah, I know how you figured. Okay, but you said two questions, kid. The other. This! <laughs> Whatever made you think I do business with a louse like you! <sighs> Marlo, he's unconscious? Yeah. If ever saw you here, your mailbox will get nothing but extortion notes for the next six months. We'll get out now. All right, Marlowe, but won't he ruin everything anyway? Don't worry, Mona. I'll convince him one way or another. Yeah. Let's see now. Hey, Marlowe, you cross me. Sure, I'll do it every time, Pomeroy. We're conflicting personalities. Police headquarters. I'd like to speak to Detective Lieutenant Matt. Holy cow. Hello. Police headquarters. Hello. Police Never mind. Pomeroy, that little huck of jewelry there on the rug. Just fell out of your pocket when I frisked you, didn't it? Didn't it? Yeah, yeah, sure it did. So what? So before I beat you senseless, get up and tell me what you got it. Come on, where'd you oh, lift it? Hey, Come on, Pomeroy. Uh, uh, get your hands off. All right. I found it at that Vivian Barge joint. It was on the floor and it sparkled like dough. She was dead, so I figured it might as well... Thanks, broke... Pomeroy. You told me all I want to know. Don't wait up. Must. <laughs> Outside, I piled into my car and drove fast for the beach house at 31 Bayfront Drive, hoping hard all the way that either I was making a fat mistake or if I was right, I was going to be on time. All told, it was about 40 minutes later when I screeched to a stop in front of the place and found it lights out and deserted. I was ready to start cheering until, from the closed garage that was tucked under a wing of the house, I heard it. A car motor running as in suicide by carbon monoxide. The big double doors were locked, but around on the side there was a window. In another minute I was in and over to Fred Sears. He was slumped over the front wheel, his face the color of wet ashes. I cut the motor, then dragged him out of the place by a back door that led to a patio. There I stretched him out on the ground and, and took a good look. A long look that left no doubt in my mind. I turned away from him when I heard a woman's footsteps on the walk outside near the window I'd broken. It was Mona Paxton. Marlowe, what is it? Marlowe, are you all right? Yeah, but don't come back here, Mona. It's not a very pretty sight. It's Sears. Sears? Yeah, I dragged him out here. He left the motor running, carbon monoxide. Oh, oh no, what a, what a terrible way to go. No worse than Vivian Barr. How'd you turn up here, Mona? Follow me? Yes. Yes, I was worried about that man in your apartment. I wanted to ask you who he was. When I took off coattail flying, it looked like something important, huh? Yes, it certainly did. And it... Certainly was. Yeah. Well, I'd 
better get through to the police now. There must be a phone inside. You can go wait at my car, huh? Quit shaking. After this, you haven't got a thing to worry about. Uh, business, I mean. Yes, I know, but I just can't start smiling. I'll be at the car, Marlowe. <laughs> Lieutenant Matthews speaking. Marlowe Matthews, out in Santa Monica, 31 Bayfront Drive. I've got Vivian Barr's killer. Fred Sears? Great. Just hold it, Phil Mooney. Hey, wait a minute. Call Santa Monica, Matthews. get a car out to 31 Bayfront you... Drive. Hey, path. Matthews. Hey, Marlowe, nice work. I'm glad I now, Will you, you wait know. a minute, Matthews? It doesn't play that way. What? What do you mean, Phil? Not Sears? No. It's a woman, Mona Paxton. Sister to Douglas Paxton, a guy married and playing around with Vivian Barr. Mona killed Vivian because Vivian was blackmailing her brother and... That, in turn, was about to ruin a business deal that meant a lot to her. An awful lot. Yeah, it must have. Yeah. What about Sears? Does he still tie in? Sure he does. She found out where Sears was hiding, which is out here at the same time I did. But she got a head start on me at the point of a gun, set him up in a closed garage in what was supposed to be suicide. Oh. He's dead, huh? No, he's fine. I was lucky enough to get here in time. He's resting out on the patio, breathing well. See you, Matthews. Everything's taken care of, Marlowe. Mm-hmm. Just about, Mona. Well, the police will, uh... Correction. The police are here. Yeah, yeah. Doesn't take them long, does it, huh? No. I, for one, am glad of it. Just as soon get all this over with. You too, I guess. Yeah. Me too, Mona. I got away from it all as soon as I could, but I didn't go home. I drove out to a spot I knew nearby, a cliff edge, where the only sounds were a couple of seagulls who couldn't sleep in the ocean a hundred feet below, crashing on the rocks. And then I took a second look at the little item Mud Pomeroy had picked up in Vivian Barr's apartment. A collection of tiny stones, diamonds, emeralds, rubies, all in the shape of a small mask. A mask that I knew would fit in place exactly over an empty spot on Mona Paxton's Mardi Gras brooch. The proof that Mona had been to Vivian's place. Yeah, a little mask. We all wear them one way or another. We've all got something to hide. Maybe that's what's wrong with people, huh? They all think they've got to hide from each other and from themselves. Yeah, so... I threw the little mask into the ocean, and then... Then I went home. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character, star Gerald Moore, are produced and directed by Richard Senville and written for radio by Robert Mitchell and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Frances Robinson, Betty Lou Gerson, Anne Stone, Olin Soule, Jay Novello, and Larry Dobkin. The special music is composed and conducted by Richard Arant. Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... This time a little man with big heels tried to run over me. A giant in a warehouse nearly cost me my life. And a treacherous blonde almost buried me at sea. All that for a client who couldn't pay me a cent. <laughs> but on whose behalf they were paid in full. This is Roy Rowan speaking for CBS, where you enjoy the contented hour every Sunday night at the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>